All right, everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the uh, MMA card for Saturday, May 14th. And it's kind of an annoying uh, GPP card uh, just because it's only 11 fights. So when you do have 11 fights, you run the risk of, well, risk, whatever. You, you have a situation where it's pretty unlikely to have a, a unique lineup, um, which uh, certainly one that makes sense, right? or certainly one that has a chance to win. Um, but that's okay. I mean, it's all right to, to create lineups that are going to be duped as long as they're not going to be duped you know, hundreds of times, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm going to be going over the card here. And one thing, a couple of things to think about. First of all, an 11 fight slate, you're not as worried about the quality of the wins that you get. In other words, if it's a 15 fight slate and you take a 9,200 guy and, and he puts up 90 points, you're probably not going to, it's probably not going to even help you, you know, because if you have 14 other fights, the math of it is just that, you know, it's just more likely that, that, that there's going to be a big score put up and God forbid, it's actually a slate that is kind of, you know, loaded with, with, with good inside the distance lines and things like that. It's just difficult on a 15 game slate, uh, 15 fight slate for kind of a mediocre win to kind of get there for you. But an 11 game slate, I mean, in the way math works, the way compounding works or reverse compounding, it's a little less likely that you're going to get a whole bunch of big scores, you know? So if you can get a W and you can get lineups with six W's, you're, you're in business, you know? And, and, and likewise, you might be able to get away with a, with a loser um, as long as he or she scores enough points in that loss. Um, if you do get one or two big scores, it's just, it's just very hard for six huge scores to show up in an 11 game slate, uh, 11 fight slate. So I guess the point of this is don't necessarily try to be an Uber hero. Like if you like an underdog that, you know, has pretty decent win equity and whatever it is, don't not play it just because, well, if, if he or she wins, maybe there's, you know, doesn't knock them out in the first round. Um, this is the, this is the card to get W's. And yet, on the other hand, if you are going to, you know, go for those high upside, big priced plays, you could also not be afraid to take shots at a, at a big underdog, even if you don't think it's going to win. You know, as, as long as it is, it, you know, as long as his style is such or her style is such that she's at least in the fight where, you know, maybe she gets 35 points in a loss. And that's that's something that's on the table for a card like this as well, because this card is also. One where you don't, I mean, there are a couple of fights that look, look pretty good, but there's no, but it's not that card that we've been used to where you like 10 fights all with huge inside the distance lines, a whole bunch of grapple, grapplers and things like that. Um, the other thing is that the ownership is pretty, pretty damn efficient this week. If you want to know the truth. I mean, I, I put it up on my sheets here and the guys that are projecting the best are going to be owned the most. And, and I know what you're thinking. Well, duh, you know, but, but, but honestly, Sometimes you do get holes in this. This week, it looks like the ownership is going to be pretty, pretty efficient. So what you can do, though, is, is, is look for, for leverage, you know, and, and look for leverage against some of the higher owned players. Um, and I think that as we go through these fights, I think there's a couple of things you could do. Like, none of this is great, but there are some things you can do. So I guess let's just start, I suppose, all the fights here, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think we're missing one, actually. Yeah, we're missing the main event, uh, which will, well, I'm not missing it. We're going to go over it, but it's not on the best, not on the this site. Um, I'd have to find it. Um, hold on, let's look at the uh, bracket. Oh, it's right over here, actually. So I guess the first thing, let's look at the main event. You know, Rakic is, is a minus 190. Uh, Jan is a plus 160. And they're being priced relatively efficient, uh, it, it, except for the fact that it's a five round fight, right? You have racket chat. Um, let's just take a look at this. Um, I'm sorry, I was, I don't have it up here. But you have racket to 8,700 and Blachowicz is, is a, at 7,500, which is, Pretty, pretty fair, I mean, given the win odds. And the other thing is that 
it is a five round fight. So, so these guys really should be closer to like 9,700 and nine, and, you know, maybe even 9,000. If the, if the algorithm did account for the five round fight, which is why the five round main events are usually extremely chalky because they're usually really good plays because the pricing does not factor that in really. Um, however, this fight, I'm getting the sense from the, the, the industry and from what people are thinking about and talking about is that this fight doesn't rate to have that much uh, upside relative to some of these other five round fights. You don't have your, you know, it doesn't rate to carry a particular lot of volume. It doesn't rate to have that great of a grappling upside. And it also, you don't have that inside the distance prop also that keeps, you know, keeps things in check. I mean, it is about minus 150 to, well, I guess almost pick up, right, to, to go to decision. And if it does finish, then you're going to, you know, look, you're going to want these guys at 8,700, 7,500. Um, and if it doesn't, though, you don't have that, I shouldn't say you don't have that same five-round cushion, because it is the same five-round cushion, but the amount of volume is not going to be quite as, as high as, as some of these five-round fights have been in the past, you know, year or so. With the exception of last week, by the way, where you had Rose Namajunas, who and her and her opponent put on a, a yawn fest in five rounds, and neither of them made the optimal. You know, um, so so I'm torn between in this fight because on the one hand it doesn't project as well as some of these other five round fights, and on the other hand, I think the combination of the the Rose five round fight bust last week, plus the the I mean, if you look up Rakic and you do these inter see these interviews, he's being accused of being uh, a boring fighter. So I think the Rakic side is not getting the same amount of love that it normally would because it doesn't rate to have that much volume, you know, whatever. So it, that five round doesn't really guarantee that he's going to score the hundred. So maybe, just maybe, the Rakic side is lower owned than he could be. I mean, I see him at forty five percent. Um, so maybe he doesn't make it over 40. Is it possible? Because what's going to happen is people are going to want to play some of these big 9K guys, and, and Blahovich is probably going to, I guess, get, if not as much ownership, at least close to it, um, as, uh, as, as Rakic. I'm showing him at 29% ownership. I don't think that's the case. I, mean, I really think that he's, he's got to be higher. But if not, I mean, no, look, I mean, I'll double check this as we get closer to the lock. But I mean, Blahovich, if you do give me five rounds with him, I mean, I'll, I'll take a shot. I mean, it's not like he's a four to one underdog. He's only, you know, minus plus 160 or whatever it is. So um, the point of it is that I was going to come on and say you don't have to play the main event, but maybe, just maybe, this main event is overlooked. Because number one, it busted one of the five main, five round fights busted last week, and maybe you know people are just going to be really just trying to pile on these other favorites. Um, in any case, I don't have much of an opinion on the fight per se. I do think that both sides are in play. Um, wanted to kind of just talk through that a little bit. Let's get to some of these other fights here. Um, well, it's all well; these are all the uh, the, the, the props of that fight. So let's first look at Maximoff versus Petrovsky, which is, I, I think it's the first fight of the night. I'm not sure, but you know, you have a minus three, three to, you know, four to one favorite who also carries with him all that wrestling upside, all that takedown upside. So he's going to be, I imagine the most popular fighter on the slate. Um, let me, I mean, I guess attempt to make the case against it. Well, there's two things. First of all, you could you could certainly go ahead and play Petrovsky and um, and uh, what you call it, and 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 get away with it. In other words, he's 6,800, and if you want to play some of these bigger favorites, you could play Petrovsky. The idea is that Petrovsky is well, a couple of things. Number one, Petrovsky is kind of a good wrestler, also. So if the scrambles kind of go in his favor, I don't know, maybe he ends up on top instead of Maximov. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of a struggle to make that case, but that's, that's the reality um, is that you have to struggle to make the case sometimes. 
And, and second of all, Maximov really hasn't fought anybody. So it's possible that maybe Maximov is just a fraud. And then at three and a half to one, it's just a, it's just a bad line. And, you know, maybe just Petrovsky can win. So that's that case. And the third case to make against the fight is that sometimes when you have, when you're so sure that you have two styles that are exactly the same, it's oftentimes they cancel each other out, meaning that, you know, Maximov's really good at wrestling. So he knows how to take down and to defend takedowns, I presume. And Petrosky, being a wrestler, knows that, you know, that he's good at takedowns, which means that he practices a lot, which he's probably good at taking, at preventing takedowns. So it's possible these guys just kind of just mess with each other and keep on stuffing takedowns. And it becomes a boring kind of striking fight, um, which means if, if that's the case, you know what you want? You, you just, you want to fade it. You know, you just don't want Maximov, probably don't want Petrosky either, right? Um, so that's the case to make against it. Uh, the, the combination of ownership, uh, the fact that Maxwell just hasn't fought anybody. You might even make the case that his name gives him a little extra boost because people think he's from Russia because he has a name like that, even though he's from the United States, possible. Um, so while, yeah, he is the biggest favorite on the card and he does have that wrestling upside, uh, I will say that, you know, there, there are paths where this fight busts. So... You're looking for an excuse to feign it. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I'm giving you one. So, Tyra versus Candelario. Um, they had this fight booked a few weeks ago, and they canceled it due to Candelario's I guess, some kind of issue. Um, the inside the distance prop is kind of poor, but Tyra also has some grappling upside. You know, he, and and one of the, the the cases that people made for Tyra last time was that, you know, Candelario is prone to have his back taken, uh, meaning, you know, the guy just kind of jumps on his back and just kind of either chokes him out or whatever. And then they notice that Tyara in some of his fights does exactly that, right? Try to take the guy's back. So people just doing their MMA math would say, oh, well, that's the case. Then this is a lot. You know, Tyara is going to be jumping on Candelario like that. Life doesn't always work out that way. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not the way it always happens. So um, the other thing I would mention is that Candelario was, was taking a lot of money in the, uh, in the sports books uh, last week, um, last time these guys fought. So he was kind of viewed as kind of a live dog then. Not so much this week because it's just, I think, the, I think the line just kind of just is kind of stabilized here. Um, so it's possible, like I said, a tire just might, might have just a little implicit bad value on him. I don't know. Um, the other thing is that Tyara is kind of an unknown, you know, he's coming here. No, one yet, no one's really ever seen him fight anybody decent. They're just kind of inferring based on tape. And while that is something good for variants, when you're an underdog, maybe it's not so great for variants when you're the favorite. So, well, yeah, I mean, nine K certainly makes some sense. You could make the case against it also, you know, so, so so I feel as though that Tyara, I show him about 35% also. You, know, you can make the case for Candelario. And, and you know what? You don't, like as I mentioned, you don't need a huge score out of a 7K guy, you know, which is what he is. What is he, 70, 7,200? Uh, let me see. Candelario is 7,200. He's one of the least popular fighters on the slate. So I, I, I would take a shot at this, you know. So in Candelario taking a shot on that, Petrosky, he's the lowest going guy on the whole state, probably. Taking a shot with that. I, I, I'm not opposed to any of this. Uh, okay, Jan Naroba against Angela Hill. So this is a fight I'm probably going to stay away from. Um, the fight doesn't go to the decision line. It's pretty poor. Neither of them have really good, um, good uh Good, that great grappling upside, you can argue that Jan Roma might be a little bit better at it, but well, not be better at it. I mean, Angela Hill is definitely the better striker, but um, just I don't think it's just quite enough to overcome the lack of a finishing upside here. So I don't, I will say that Angela Hill, no, nah, I was going to say, I don't like the Angela Hill side. I think we go back to, to, to win condition on this one. I mean, I think that if you, if you, Play, I think I prefer you play Jandaroba as if she does win, maybe she does score because of the takedowns. 
possibly, but I don't see any reason to go with Angela Hill, you know, unless she's, the only thing I would say once again, is she's only 16% owned. So if, if you can get that wind out of her, what you're going to get, you know, a good solid 40% of the time, maybe even more, you know, at 7,700, I don't know. I think I'd rather take that same shot on, Candelario at a little bit of a more, I don't know, who's better, Candelario at 7,200 or Angela Hill at 7,700? I think it's close. I, I still prefer Candelario. And Jandaroba, again, I just think there's better things you could do than play Jandaroba in general on this slate. All right, so here's the next one, which is which is getting a lot of, a lot of talk. And that's the Michael jo Johnson versus Alan Patrick. Um, this is this, so. This is what I'm hearing, right? So I'm hearing that Michael Johnson has is just so much better, and he just always finds a way to lose. And he, if he you know, he's finally found this this matchup against Patrick, which while it's dangerous to play Johnson because he's unreliable, he's just probably just has that much better skill set, and he kind of rates the win. Um, I have not yet really heard anybody make an actual case for Patrick, you know. And the fact is that Patrick is only plus one, you know, 120. And I'll just say, he's got to have something, you know? So what I would say is that this is kind of a, a kind of a sneaky fight, I think, to target both sides. And because I'm looking at this, I see Michael Johnson 24% owned, which on this slate is not that big of a deal. And then I see Patrick at 17%. I mean, you look at the inside the distance prop here, and it says about a pickup. So that means that 50% of the time this fight finishes. So when you have a situation where you have, um, let's look at this, the, the odds here. I mean, the prices, an 8,400, 7,800 fight, which is gonna finish 50% of the time on an 11 fight slate, I think that's gonna be enough. You know, That means that if you wanna play Patrick, probably, I mean, we're, we're kind of, fudging the numbers a little bit here because I'm sure let's take a look actually Patrick wins by KO plus 600 that's not so hot then you got Patrick wins plus 750 Patrick wins inside the distance plus 350 actually more like plus 400 so maybe that's not such a great side maybe maybe the Michael Johnson side is the great side after all because you have Michael Johnson winning inside the distance plus 240. So that means about 25% of the time, or even 30% of the time, he's going to be in the optimal. And maybe, maybe that's enough. Um, tough one, tough card. Um, so maybe Patrick is just kind of a bad play. Um, unless, again, is 7,700 just getting the win enough? I don't know. It's only a pick em fight. Actually, minus 145 plus 125. Boy, um, maybe you're supposed to just run this through the optimizer and just go with what it spits out because I'm finding it difficult to really find a great play so far. Let's see. Maybe we find one a little later. Uh, Arroyo, Arahu versus uh, Angie Lee, a women's fight with a fight doesn't go to decision line, plus 200, so kind of hopeless. And I guess Arahu is, Arahu's got a little bit better, better chance for a score because of her takedowns, but it's just not going to be enough, I don't think. Um, I, I think I'm just going to, if I have to take a stand somewhere, I guess I'm just going to avoid this one. If anything, I would say Arahu or nothing. And if I look at the, at the ownership here, who's, the, who's more owned here? Arahu, 28%. Versus Lee, who would be 32. So I guess I would try for Arahu, uh, given the choice between these two. All right, so Jake Hadley against Alan Nascimento. So we have, this is an interesting style fight, because apparently Jake Hadley is going to try to take him down. And apparently Nascimento doesn't mind getting taken down, because what I've, I've learned from this week is that Nascimento he likes to, you know, fire up submission attempts off his back. So he's not to really care too much about taking down, get taken down. But what I found is that that is, that is kind of a recipe for disaster. Um, 
if Hadley is, has any brain at all, right, he's going to see that. He's going to know that. And he's going to say, okay, I'll take you down. And then I'll just kind of just, you know, make sure I don't get submitted. You know what I mean? I'll just kind of just, you know, I won't get too aggressive when I'm on top, which might affect my score, but I'll just kind of mind my, my, my business and just make sure that I don't get, get submitted off of him once I'm, once I'm on top of him. So I, I think that this could be a fight once again, where you might want to take a shot at both sides. I mean, you do have that submission upside from Nassimianto. Um, but you have, I think, the safety of Hadley being able to get these takedowns, and his ownership is not that high. You know, he's at 8,800. Um, he's only about 23% owned. So maybe this is a fight to take a shot on, maybe both sides. Uh, Camacho Torres. So this one is one where I might have to take a stand. And the reason why is that I feel as though this fight is going to be really tough. Because you have this pricing uh, situation where they're both about 8K. And, and th again, this is all week I've heard this, that Torres and Camacho, they just like to throw down, you know. And, and, and Camacho especially doesn't mind getting hit. And Torres, although he's, you know, there's a, a lack of tape on him, what they've shown is that he, you know, does have some good combinations or whatever. So you look at this inside the distance line and it looks pretty strong. And you look at the price and it looks pretty strong too. So people are going to go to this fight. It's going to be really popular. I'll, I'll treat this like I talk about baseball. If you do play this fight, because it is going to project well, just make sure you don't put it with anything else chalky, you know, because you then you're really getting into Duke City here. So um, do I have an opinion on either side? Uh, I guess... I'm just kind of fading the public here. Actually, not even. They're both going to be pretty equally owned. I really don't have much of an opinion on the sides. I will say that whoever I take from this fight, make sure you don't put them with anything else chalky. Um, okay. Uh, Chukagian against Hibas. All right. You want to take? Fine. Here's something. Um, if, you, if, you, if you Google, like, fade of the week, like, this is what everybody's going to come up with is that Chukagin is just hopeless as far as DFS upside. Um, for an 8,600 to 9K fighter, she's going to get really no ownership. And, and, and maybe that's true. Maybe that, you know, she doesn't have that kind of upside to, to, to score 100. But, you know, she's a 180 favorite like some of these others. And she's only 8,600 as well. So, maybe her low ownership is going to make lineups with her a little more uh, unique. So I, I would say that Chukagin, don't just X her out. If you get to some of her, I would play her. Hibas, I'll probably just avoid. So now these next two fights, this is, these are the last two fights. And, and, and again, as I like to say with my baseball slates, this is probably where I'm going to lose. Um, because this is where I'm going to just, probably be stupid, but this, I, I'm just going to talk myself into this. So you have David Grant, who's a minus 300 favorite against Lewis Smolka. And David Grant is, I have him as the most popular fighter on the slate. Um, I have him as having the highest projection on the slate. And the reason why is that he hits really hard. He has some good round one KOs on his resume. And despite the, fact, despite the fact that he lost his last two, you know, he's, he does have those big K1 results. He's got a Martin, Martin, Martin Day KO. He's got some, he has a lot of power. And then what you have is him fighting Louis Smoka, who, you know, he has some first round submissions and first round loss against him. And the, the thing that's staring everybody right in the face is in his last fight, he got knocked out in the first round. So you combine the Davy Grant with the KO upside and with the um, Smoka getting knocked out in the first rounds, you get Davy Grant as huge chalk. But I wanna, I wanna make this case, and again, I don't usually put my, my actual fight takes above the projections and above the things, but I was, every time I have, I've been pretty good. I actually went and watched the Smoka fight 
against Morales. I also watched the predictions again leading up to it, just for, for fun. And the predictions leading up for it had it probably an even fight, probably a lot, maybe a couple more people had it for Smoker than for Morales. And I can't show that fight here, but I encourage you to watch it because the Smoker was doing just fine. <laughs> he was he was kicking him. He was he was punching him. He, he looked really good. He had 22 significant strikes in the first like two minutes or whatever. And then if you look at it, he just got got caught. You know, he ran into an impossible punch. I don't think anybody, if they ran into that punch, was not going to get knocked out. OK, so I, I am willing to chalk that up to variance that his face just happened to, you know, to run into the perfect punch. And I'll make the case that he was doing well in that round before he ran into that. So you look at like chaos theory, right? If he does not run into that punch, maybe he ends up winning and the whole, everything's different, you know? So I'm willing to back um, Smoka in this matchup. Um, I'm willing to take a shot on him at 7,100. I really don't care if he has any upside at all. I'm just willing to take, make the case that the line is bad and that he wins this fight more than one in the four times that he's being priced for. And the reason why I'm willing to take that stand as well is because David Grant is going to be the most popular fighter on the slate. So you're getting a lot of leverage against him. And um, yeah, and that's, I think, where I'm going to lose. So it's like, that's one of those things where even if I'm right about it, I'm still going to lose the fight like 30, you know, 75% of the time. Um, so in any case, that's probably what I'm going to do. Uh, am I going to play some David Grant? Yeah, I am. Um, just in case I'm wrong, I am going to play David Grant to get that first round KO. Um, but if I do, certainly the rest of the lineups are going to be just like, like screwy. You know, there's no way I'm playing David Grant in a chalk line. So um, that's stance number one. And stance number two, probably a little bit lower down the list, is the Kutalaba versus Span. Uh, can't find really uh, anybody who's going to is recommending Span here. Um, and I saw him get a first round KO before. Uh, he's got power, and you know I'll take a shot with that. But he's not someone that I'm betting on because of you know just necessarily his win odds because. I don't think that he gets the win unless he knocks them out. He's a real upside GPP type play. Um, I don't, I think there's almost zero chance he wins the decision. So he's the guy to put in with say my David Grant lineups, right? He's the guy to put in with my, who is it? My, uh, my, my Camacho uh, uh, Torres lineups. So that's where I would do with span. I would not put span. I mean, I, I, I would rather play, for example, mm, like Candelario than Span in general, you know, I think Candelario might have a little, little better win ups, uh, you know, win equity, even though Span has maybe a little bit better upside. Uh, even though I'm looking at this, I, Span is looking, he's only plus 180. It's not like he's a, a lot to lose. I mean, the more I'm looking at Span, I think he's a strong play here at that price. So, that's where I'm coming in. I'm, I'm coming in with the span and the smoker. <laughs> I'm probably going to lose, but that, that's, that's what I think I'm doing is get different on this slate. Um, I'll get overweight on both these guys and hopefully my, my, my approach to how I'm going to play the other sides of those fights was pretty self-explanatory. Uh, that'll, that's it. Good luck, everybody. And uh, let's get it.